So, um, oops. So, hello everyone. Um, oops, sorry, this I have to go back. Um, so, yeah, this is the fifth, I think, session now, or fourth, I think, the fifth session we are doing now. Um, Dermatology Pathology Quiz Space Teaching uh, on behalf of uh, SIG Dermatology, Pathology, which is IRD Vale Academy and uh, Dermapath Society of India. I don't know if anybody from the academy is here. Lalit sir or Dr. Gashmi, I don't know if they're here. Sometimes they log in. Um, if not, um, on behalf, I would like to thank uh, the IRD Vale Academy and uh, DSA as well for supporting this. And also, of course, uh, Glodama, who's uh, been helpful in providing a platform for us and uh, disseminating the information to the participants. So uh, the session today is on evaluation of granulomatous disorders. So people who have um, joined in a little bit late because of technical issue, uh, tech team, please uh, repost the password, the, the Kahoot pin code uh, in the um, screen. I'll uh, show that again. So the game pin is 922949. So this is an interactive quiz-based teaching session. We'll give a bit of time for participants to log in because there's been a technical issue. Um, today's quiz will have about 19 questions. Now, interestingly, last time, and this is the first time this happened, even though the person who got the first rank actually answered one question less, the person scored uh, highest because uh, they answered the quickest. So uh, this is how Kahoot, how Kahoot works. It's an interesting concept. So how it works is that... Um, um yeah so first of all please make arrangements so those of you who are new to this quiz based uh, teaching concept please make sure that you have uh, a good laptop and also a, a stable internet connection also a second uh, device to uh, do the kahoot uh, questions is is good so if you can log in to uh, a laptop and a phone something like that it is helpful so that uh, I know you can answer uh, the quiz in a different device and watch the presentation on a different device that is um, going to give you an advantage. And please, when you're logging into Kahoot, uh, log in with your full names, uh, including surname uh, for identification so that we can, when you distribute the prize, it will be easier. Now, the time for each question may vary based on the difficulty of the question. And once attempted, we cannot go back to the previous question. Each question is marked out of 1,000 points. Uh, the maximum points are scored by the fastest correct answer. Um, three questions are allotted 20 seconds. The person who answers at the fifth second will score more than the person who answers at the 10 second. Sorry, just give me a second. I'm getting a call from the technical team. I'll just uh, hang on. Sorry about this. So uh, there's a streak bonus. So if you get two or more answers correct in a row, you earn an additional 100 points per answer, up to 500 points. Wrong answer or not attempting gets you zero points. And uh, yes, if you don't know the answer at all and have decided to guess, please guess fast. Uh, because if you get it right, then you get no points. Um, then, um, yeah, so we've come to the first question. But before that, I would like to display the game pin again. We've all got about 28 participants so far. I think there'll be more because each time we have about 50. So those of you who have not uh, managed to log in, this is the game pin. I'll give you about uh, three more minutes so that if you've just logged in, you can see the game pin and uh, enter that in the Kahoot app and you can uh, join the quiz. So the game pin is 922-949 or you can even scan the QR code if it's displayed on your system. So please log in with your full names. Even if you miss the first question or so, if you answer all the questions correct, you will um, I mean, you'll have still have a better chance. So don't worry if you missed one or two questions. It's all about the experience. Um, if you have any queries, uh, please post them in the chat box at the end, and uh, I'll be happy to answer them. I've got more people logging in. We've got 51 participants so far. Sorry, 41 uh, People logged into the quiz so far. Sorry. How many people are logged into the actual live stream? Tech team? Sir, there are the uh, one, one, four uh, people right now. Sorry, one? One, four. One, four, 14? No, 127 people. 127 people. 
127 people are logged in, but okay, what only 42 have. So please, if you even if you don't want the prize or if you want to answer anonymously, you can put in a random name and answer. Uh, it's fun if you participate in the quiz because it's it's a learning experience. So even if you you know your if you don't want your name to be shown and you want to log in anonymously, please do. You can have a random name. It's just that you won't receive the prize at the end of it, but please do log in. Uh, it's fun if you log into the quiz. It's 8.13. I'll give it two more minutes because we, are, we have had a technical issue before we start. Um, some people may have logged in late. So 48, once the count reaches 50, perhaps we'll start unless, you know, time's up. So 922949 is a pin. Yes, so count has reached 50. So I think we can start now. Um, hope everybody's okay with that. So the first question uh, in the quiz is, oops, not this, uh, just a second. Uh, lost the screen, yeah, this. Okay. Right, okay. So this is the first question. Which of the following features, which of the following features are essential to call and infiltrate granular matters? So which of the following cells rather, okay? are essential to call and infiltrate granular matters. You've got your options here, but they'll be displayed in the Kahoot anyway. So I'll start the quiz and people who are joining late can still see the Kahoot uh, pin. So the first question coming up on Kahoot, which of these following cells are essential to call and infiltrate granular matters? Okay. So the 19 question, the 20th question is just a feedback thing. So if this is your options. So, um, a lot of people have got it right. In fact, all the above are not really needed to call and infiltrate granular matters. Giant cells certainly are not needed. In a lot of granular matters infiltrates, we don't see giant cells all the time. So, what is a granuloma? I think boils down to that, isn't it? Um, so let us see who's answered first of all. Let's see how the leaderboard is like. It's only first question. So Fatima, Nazir, Nivedita, Anu, Philip, Dexa, and Neha at the top, but a lot of you have got the uh, got the answer right. So what are the essential features to call something a granuloma? A granuloma is defined as a relatively discrete collection of histiocytes. So histiocytes are essential component. There may or may not be other inflammatory cells. So if you have only histiocytes together, with some other cells, which may be lymphocytes in a lot of cases, um, then you know you have a sarcoidal granuloma where you have predominantly histiocytes. You may have some lymphocytes there, but the main cell there is a histiocytes, a discrete collection of histiocytes. That's the definition of a granuloma with or without other inflammatory cells, which includes lymphocytes, a variable number of admixed multinucleate giant cells of various types, with or without central necrosis. So this is the definition of a granuloma, okay? And that's why I put up the first question. So there are essentially two types of histiocytes. Um, the first type is something called an epithelioid histiocyte. So an epithelioid histiocyte refers to a uh, histiocyte which has got a slipper-shaped nucleus, okay? So that's what we call an epithelioid cell, which looks like an epithelial cell. Uh, sorry for the interruption, tech team, if there's any essential message in the chat, uh, technical message or anything else, please have a look and let me know. Um, so the other type of histiocyte is what we call a foamy histiocyte, which has got a foamy cytoplasm. The, the nucleus of that particular uh, histiocyte is also similar. There is no major difference in the nucleus. It's just a cytoplasm that is different. The cytoplasm of an epithelioid histiocyte is, is clear. Usually slightly histophilic hue may be there, but uh, the cytoplasm of a foamy histiocyte has got a foamy cytoplasm as the name implies. So it comes to the second question. Foamy histiocytes can be seen in. Okay, let's go to Kahoot. So foamy histiocytes can be seen in. Let's see. So those of you who have uh, joined late, the Kahoot pin is visible here. So borderline leprosy, xanthogranuloma, lobular granulitis, or algae. So those of you who have joined late, you still want to join, right? Fine. What is the Kahoot pin? Want to join the quiz? Please do. Excellent. So all of you have got, most of you have got the correct answer. 
So borderline leprosy, xanthogranuloma, and lobular panniculitis all can, um, you know, um, present with foamy histiocytes. Um, let's see what how the leaderboard is like. So Dexa has gone to the top. Fatima Nazir, Savega Gupta, who's won a number of uh, previous quizzes, is at number three, followed by Nivedita and Vikas Solanki. Okay. So let's see the explanation for this. Uh, well, actually, let us uh, go back to some basics first because there's another question and after which there'll, there'll be an explanation. So epithelial histocytes, as I said, resemblance to epithelial cells, over elongated, slipper shaped vesicular nuclei, readily discernible, eosinophilic cytoplasm. Indistinct cell margins is a very uh, important feature, and the tendency to seeming cohesiveness. So the cells seem to, the cell margins seem to be merging with each other. So you see here, this is a prototype of uh, an epithelioid uh, or, 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 or a, a tuberculoid granuloma, actually, where you see epithelioid histocytes coalescing together. You can't really make out the cytoplasm or the cell borders from one another. They seem to be coalescing with each other. This is the higher power. Eosinophilic cytoplasm, but where are the cell borders? You know, you can hardly see the cell borders. These are slipper-shaped nuclei. These are called epithelioid nuclei, epithelioid cells. The nucleus is slipper-shaped, and vesicular uh, nuclei. You know, they have they don't they're not dark and round. They're they're sort of uh, pale and vesicular. So this these are epithelioid histiocytes. Okay, I think we mentioned this in the basics anyway. So foamy uh, non-epithelioid histocytes have histocytes with foamy cytoplasm, not eosinophilic, usually seen in the conditions we've already quizzed you about. And this is an example of foamy histocyte in lepromatous leprosy. You see the foamy histocytes have got a foamy cytoplasm. You can see the foamy clear cytoplasm here. And the nucleus is uh, similar, it's epithelioid. There's no difference in the nucleus as such. So when we go to the evaluation of granulomas, the first thing we do in the evaluation of granulomas, so we discovered the basics, we covered the types of um, the epithelioid cells, the type of cells we see. Then we go into the types of granulomas that we may see. So the three things that we uh, use for the evaluation of granulomas is the type of granulomas, then the arrangement of granulomas, and the presence of ancillary features. I'll discuss the ancillary features in a second. So uh, what are the types of granulomas? The four major types of granulomas the first one being a sarcoidal granuloma, where you don't see any lymphocytes or hardly any lymphocytes. Uh, but essentially, it's a collection of epithelioid cells with or without some giant cells, as you can see here. This is a tuberculoid granuloma, where you see a mantle of lymphocytes around the, um, around the collection of histiocytes. Often, you see uh, giant cells within a tuberculoid granuloma, but that's not always the case. This is an example of a palisading granuloma where you see a central area of necrosis or necrobiasis with palisade of histiocytes around the central necrobiotic focus. This has got polymorphs in it. These are polymorphs. This is called a separative granuloma. So these are the four essential uh, types of granulomas. All right. So um, the next one is actually a picture-based quiz. So what is the type of granuloma shown here? Okay, you're going to be shown three pictures and you've got four options, separated sarcoidal tuberculoid necrobiotic, which are the four different types of granulomas, but I expect you to, start to know some basics, though, uh, though I'm going to explain that later on, but this quiz should test you out on both ways, your basic knowledge and your knowledge after the quiz as well. So this is the first picture, low power view, showing the distribution of the infiltrate, also showing uh, the granulomata here, uh, I'll explain the slides later on after the quiz. You can see here, granuloma with collection, okay? And this is a high power view of the granuloma, okay? So you've got one, two, and three, okay? And yes, now we have to open Kahoot and start the quiz. Let's see. So what are the type of granuloma shown? It should be an easy one. Because of all the explain the distance. Okay, right. So, um, yeah, a lot of you have got it right, but some of you have got it wrong. This is a typical tuberculoid granuloma. 
Why do I call it tuberculoid? I'll explain that in a second. So let's see what the leaderboard is looking like. So yeah, Fatima, Savera, Vikas, Amazon Falcon 56, whoever that is, and Nivedita are on the top. Arvind has a streak of three correct answers in a row. Remember, if you've got a streak, you get uh, extra bonus points. Okay, so let's uh, see what um, these are. So in the first, oops, um, right, okay. So in this, uh, what you're seeing here, in this um, low power picture, the epidermis is normal. You're seeing a superficial and deep infiltrate of... Uh, hello, sir. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, your screen is not visible, sir. My screen is not visible? Yes, sir. Okay, let me share it again, uh, maybe. I'm sharing the entire desktop. <laughs> but uh, right now, it is not visible. Can you see okay. now? Yes, yes. Sir. yes, sir. Right, okay. okay. When, did, when was the connection lost? Uh, no, sir, it is not lost. I guess uh, someone has shared their screen. That's why your screen is not visible. Okay, okay, okay. got it, got it. Okay, fine. Um, so um, what you can see here now is a superficial and deep infiltrate of lymphocytes and histiocytes. Why do I say histiocyte? I told you the epithelioid cells have got a eosinophilic cytoplasm. That's the paler areas there. And you're seeing the dark staining cells here, okay? So you're seeing that here. So this is a tuberculoid granuloma. Why is it a tuberculoid granuloma? Because you're seeing a collection of histiocytes with surrounding lymphocytes, okay? So this is tuberculoid. There are no, there are no, um, there's no collagenolysis. These are um, just normal granulomas. They're not, there's no palisading, okay? So it's not a palisading right up granuloma. This is a giant cell you can see here and quite nicely, a lang hand type of giant cell here. And you're seeing a lot of lymphocytes here. These round blue cells are lymphocytes. And these are the Langhand giant cells, and you're seeing histiocytes here in uh, high power view as well. Okay. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. We'll answer that later. So, tubercular granulomas are seen in a number of conditions, including tuberculosis, tuberculids, leprosy, in the, especially in the tubercular uh, TT spectrum, dysphaniasis, rosacea, and uh, LMDF, OFG, uh, orofacial granulomatosis, that is, and Crohn's disease, etc. Now, this is an easy one now here. So, you've got one, two, three. I want to I want you to tell me what are the arrows pointing at? Okay. So you've got one, two, and three. I'm not going to use the pointer any further, but here are your options. So is the first option is giant cell, histiocyte, and histiocyte in that order. Second option is lymphocyte, giant cell, and endothelial cell in that order. Third option is lymphocyte, giant cell, and histiocyte in that order. And fourth option is giant cell, giant cell, and histiocyte in that order. Okay. Now, in the Kahoot app, it's going to show the options again. So look at the picture carefully, make up your mind, and I'm going to Kahoot in one, two, and three seconds. Okay, here we go. So in the order of what I've shown you, what are the arrows pointing at? Again, uh, I think 45 is the number that most of you are getting uh, getting the correct answers. But don't worry, the rest of you, uh, this is a learning experience. You don't need to get everything right as long as you're learning and 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 uh, you know remembering. So again, those of you who want to join Kahoot, that's the pin there if you want to join. So um, let's see who who's um, leading. Um, so Nivedita and Jelena have come up. Ten players have reached an answer streak of three. Well done. So let's see what these cells are. So I told you, this is a lymphocyte. It's a dark, round, staining cell, the lymphocytes. That's a giant cell. This is a nice, round, Langerhans Jane cell, okay? And that's a histocyte. You can see that here. That's a histocyte. These are not, there's no giant cell here. These are lymphocytes in between, and this is a giant cell. This is a uh, histocyte slipper-shaped nucleus. Now, within a giant cell as well, most of the nuclei will be like histocytes. But you can look at the shape. And look at the cytoplasm here. This is a giant cell. It's just that if the, the cytoplasm becomes so cohesive and confluent, the giant cell is not, you know, is hardly discernible from the surrounding uh, cells. Okay. So you can understand how a giant cell is formed because all the cells merge together. And uh, this is how a giant cell is formed. Okay. So um, we've now got the answer here. So this is an example of a sarcoidal granuloma. Now, why do I say sarcoidal? 
The typical feature of a sarcoidal granuloma is that very few lymphocytes comparatively. Now, there are some lymphocytes. Of course, in sarcoidal granuloma, there will be lymphocytes. So don't um, imagine a sarcoidal granuloma to be bereft of lymphocytes. There will be lymphocytes, but they are not the main feature. You see collection of epithelioid histocytes, usually well circumscribed. So the way we identify sarcoidal granulomas is that the granulomas are very well circumscribed. In comparison to, say, this uh, case, here the granulomas are not circumscribed. And, and usually in tuberculoid granulomas, the granulomas are ill-defined. Okay? But in sarcoidal granulomas, the granulomas are very well defined and they tend to be bunched together. So you see this granuloma discrete, this granuloma discrete, this granuloma discrete, and usually composed of epithelioid cells with a very with very few lymphocytes, usually peppered within the histiocytes and also around the periphery. So this is the typical appearance of a sarcoidal granuloma. Okay. So which of the following is false? Okay, I'll show all the options because it's long options. So question number five. Presence of sarcoidal granuloma does not exclude tuberculoid Hansen's. Presence of tuberculoid granulomas in sarcoidosis is very rare. Presence of a foreign body, maybe a small wood splinter within a tuber within a granuloma, excludes sarcoidosis. Or number four, secondary syphilis may present with sarcoidal granulomata, and you only have one false answer within these. Okay, so your options I've already read them out. Let's go to Kahoot, where you'll have to answer this question. Ballpark number 45, 44 uh, seem to be getting the answer right. So foreign body excludes sarcoidosis is a false answer. Sarcoidal granulomata do not, ex the, uh, the presence of sarcoidal granuloma does not exclude tuberculoid Hansen. Sometimes in tuberculoid Hansen, we discussed this in our Dermpath WhatsApp group recently. Presence of a tuberculoid granuloma, uh, uh, sarcoidal granuloma, sorry, does not exclude tuberculoid Hansen's. Um, tuberculoid Hansen's can sometimes present with sarcoidal granulomata. I'll explain how we identify them later. And uh, yes, tubercular granuloma and sarcoidosis are very rare, but you can see them. It's not unusual. And often the diagnosis is based on CBC. This is a very contentious topic. It's a lot of papers have been written on it, how to differentiate between tubercular granuloma and sarcoidal granulomas. It's not always easy. And yes, secondary syphilis may present with sarcoidal granuloma. So the leaderboard, um, now Vikas is up on top, Jalina, Savera. I think all of you are getting the answers right. But the thing is, uh, because whoever is answering first is going on top, okay? So tough round, four players have lost their answer streak of four, apparently. Okay, I like tough. So conditions where sarcoidal granulomas may be present, there's a big list. I'm not going to read them out. Uh, you can read them in the textbook. But, you know, essentially sarcoidosis, but a number of conditions may present with sarcoidal granulomata, including granuloma annulare. Okay. So this is a study where they tried to differentiate between sarcoidosis and tuberculoid leprosy. And you see here, naked tubercles were found in 24% of tuberculoid leprosy. And only in 55% of cutaneous sarcoidosis. Isn't that interesting? Um, there are a number of other... Um, please uh, switch on the mic. Can you please switch it off, please? Right, okay. So... Um, this is the, this is a study where they have shown this is a paper they have shown cutaneous sarcoidosis with tuberculoid granulomas. So it is quite difficult. This is a case of uh, tuberculoid Hansen's actually, where you see you know there's some resemblance to sarcoidosis, very little lymphocytes around, though you see some dense lymphocytes here. But if you just look at this section, you can see we can understand that these uh, granulomas look sarcoidal, very well circumscribed as well. So how do we differentiate? Uh, well, here's a question for you first. A case clinically suspected to be tuberculosis T.T. Hansen's shows sarcoidal granulomas. So let's see how many of you know the answer. Which of the following is true? How do we actually differentiate? So you can see here, this is tuberculosis Hansen's with sarcoidal granulomata. There are very few lymphocytes. So how do you differentiate tuberculosis, uh, sorry, uh, T.T. Hansen's from sarcoidosis? So these are the options. Which of the following is true? A negative AFB stain favors the diagnosis of sarcoidosis. Which of the following is true, okay? A negative PCR test exclude Hans excludes Hansen's. Elevated serum ACE levels favor Hansen's. Okay. Or the presence of perineural granulomas does not exclude sarcoidosis. 
So I want you to tell me which of the following is true. There is only one true answer among these. And if you've uh, listened to my previous two minutes of lecture, you'll be able to answer this actually. Because we've already discussed this. <laughs> This time, unfortunately, uh, we've got uh, lesser correct answers. So actually, contrary to popular opinion, elevated serum ACE levels do not favor sarcoidosis. In fact, in, there are papers where they've shown in tuberculoid Hansen's, especially, serum ACE levels are elevated. Okay, So it's not specific to sarcoidosis. So that's the reason I put up that particular option. Uh, if you know, or if you've seen my previous uh, slide where I've shown you the study where they've tried to differentiate between um, tuberculoid ha uh, Hansen's and uh, sarcoidosis in one of the, um, in the table, they've shown that perineural granulomas can be present in sarcoidosis, okay? So sarcoidosis can also have perineural granulomas and doesn't exclude the diagnosis. It's just that the nerves are not destroyed in sarcoidosis. Whereas in tuberculoid Hansen's or in Hansen's in general, nerves are destroyed. And that's why we do an S100 stain sometimes to see if the nerve is destroyed or not, okay? A negative AFB stain does not favor the diagnosis of sarcoidosis because AFB stain is usually negative in tuberculosis Hansen's. A negative PCR test does not exclude Hansen's because depending on the study and depending on the probe used, hardly in about 20 to 50 percent of cases, only PCR may be positive, okay? So often we, we, we think that, okay, it's Han I think maybe Hansen's, let's send for a PCR because I'm not sure. Unfortunately, that's, that's not going to give you the answer. Uh, most often, the way I do it is a therapeutic trial. If you are in doubt, treat for Hansen's, wait for a month, see the response, and then take it from there. Okay, let's see who's got the correct answer. We've got Arvind on top now, uh, followed by Savera Gupta, Keeper, Manandar, Swati, and Dex are excellent. Well done. Those of you who come onto the leaderboard for the first time, three players have reached the answer streak of five. Okay. So, um, so these are the infectious conditions where sarcoidal granulometer may be seen. I've just put up the slide, though the previous slide had an extensive list. Yeah, I, I told you there's a, the, so in this particular uh, slide, if you look at uh, invasion of nerves, zero and tuberculosis in, in sarcoidosis, whereas perineal infiltrates, um, I don't know, if the, oh, this wasn't there in this, okay. Um, where perineal infiltrates can be present in this. They have not actually mentioned this. There is, I think that was referring to another study, which I've not shown here. Um, yeah, but perineal infiltrates are, are present in also sarcoidosis and tuberculoid leprosy, though invasion of nerves is only seen in tuberculoid leprosy. Okay. So, um, right. Sarcoidosis. In the Indian context, may be very difficult to diagnose. As you know, sarcoidosis is a diagnosis of exclusion. So if you are in doubt, uh, you have to go by clinical. Yeah, this is the study. Perineal granulomas are identified in 62% of patients in of sarcoidosis and uh, in 55% in of the biopsies. The clue is that nerves are not destroyed, okay? So this is the study I was referring to. I haven't shown you this to you earlier, but yeah, this is the paper. So um, in the Indian context, first exclude Hansen's with a therapeutic trial. That's what I do. Uh, if you have any other suggestions, please do put it on your, uh, in the chat box. So how, what are the clues to Hansen's? Uh, neural destruction, infiltration of Altos pylori, periacrine granulomas, which is a very important clue. Um, AFB stain PCR can be done, um, and then uh, therapeutic trial, of course, at the end. So this brings us on to the next granuloma, which is a separative granuloma. This is a very nice textbook example. You see a bunch of, you know, collection of neutrophils. This is a basic separative abscess surrounded by lymph, uh, surrounded by histiocytes, okay? And then you're seeing lymphocytes around it. This is a typical example of a separative granuloma. So the two major types of separative granulomas, and that also depends on the diagnosis. One is called a true separative granuloma. Now, this particular example is not a true separative granuloma. A true separative granuloma is basically a true granuloma where you're seeing a lot of lymphocytes, lots of a lot of histiocytes, sorry, and a lot of lymphocytes with some with a sprinkling of neutrophils here and there in between. And you see this in uh, warty lupus, TB, atypical mycobacterial infections, leishmaniasis, and deep mycosis, okay? 
uh, where then this is called a mixed or a mycotic granuloma. Okay, this is called a true suppurative granuloma, um, and uh, or a mixed mycotic granuloma. You see this in a number of other conditions as well. So this is an example. You're not seeing a nice suppurative abscess. You're seeing a sprinkling of neutrophils amongst the histiocytes and giant cells and lymphocytes. Now, the second type of separative granuloma is called a primarily separative or a poorly formed granuloma. And a typical example of this is miliary TB or artificial TB as well. Also, you see in Majochi's granuloma, Petrosporum folliculitis, where you see a separative focus, you see a microapsis or in herpes or also in deep mycosis in initial phases. Okay, So this is called a primarily separative or a poorly formed granuloma. Uh, this is not a true uh, separative granuloma. True separative granuloma is, is this which is also called a mycotic granuloma, a mixed granuloma, where you see this primarily in, in chronic deep mycosis or atypical mycobacteria or, deep, or leishmaniasis typically. So this is a primarily separative granuloma. This is an example of Miller TB, okay? You see this here. See this here? Uh, you still see giant cells, still see lymph uh, histiocytes and lymphocytes around the periphery, but essentially you're seeing a microapsis here in the center around which is, are these collections of histiocytes and lymphocytes. Okay, this brings us on to question number seven. So this is a 54-year-old female diabetic with an annular plaque on the right forearm. Okay, you've got three pictures. So look at this picture, low power. Diagnosis by silhouette. Look at the low power. Try to make come to a differential diagnosis. Slightly higher power. I'm not going to explain the features uh, yet. So I'll do that after the quiz, after the answer is discussed. Okay, higher power. And this is further higher power. Uh, this is actually another case, actually. It's not the same case, but I've given this to you as a clue to the diagnosis because this is not so clear. This is much more well-stained. Okay, so this should be enough to come to a diagnosis. So which of the following is false? I'm not asking you for the diagnosis. So if there is a hypoesthesia clinically, BT Hansen's, borderline tuberculoid Hansen's cannot be ruled out. Which of these is false? The second option, the diagnosis granuloma annulari. Third option, the histological picture is compatible with interstitial granulomatous dermatitis. Fourth option, stains from mucin are likely to be positive. Sorry, somebody switch off your mic, please. All right, so we go on to the quiz. Which of the following is false? got a lot of people who got the answer wrong, actually. Yes, the correct answer, or rather the false answer, is that if there is hyperesthesia clinically, BT Hansen's cannot be ruled out, is actually the wrong answer. Uh, the diagnosis is indeed, indeed, indeed granuloma annulare. I told you there's an annular plaque. And this is a typical example of, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, yeah, this is a typical example of granuloma annulare. Uh, sorry, let's resume. Okay. So the leaderboard, Sadega Gupta is on the top, found Aravind, Vikas, Gitanjali, and Nivedita. Uh, three players have dropped their answer streak of five. Now let's see why this is the answer. So here on low power, you're seeing what we call a busy dermis. This is what we call a busy dermis. There's no pattern to it. In Hansen's, what we call there's a leprosy pattern where the infiltrate follows the neurovascular bundles or the appendageal structures. Here, you're seeing the infiltrate is diffuse and within the interstitium. And here you're seeing the collagen bundles being degenerate. Can you see the collagen bundles? They're thickened in some places and fragment in others, degenerate. Uh, and there are some lymphocytes surrounding these collagen bundles. See, uh, this is a lymphocyte, sorry, the histiocyte, this is a histiocyte, histiocyte, histiocytes here surrounding the degenerate collagen bundles and some sprinkling of lymphocytes. This is actually a much clearer picture. You see the darkly stained degenerate collagen, degenerate collagen stains a bit more darkly. And if you do a mucin stain, you'll see mucin between the collagen fibers, okay? So this is a case of granulomanulari, the interstitial variant, and this particularly shares features with 
interstitial granuloma annulare, interstitial granulomatous dermatitis as well, and stains from mucin are likely to be positive. And this is why this is called a blue granuloma, because the granuloma looks blue, okay? Uh, even though if there's hyposthesia clinically, I wouldn't actually consider Hansen's in this case, because hyposthesia is, can be, you know, I said hyposthesia, not anesthesia, really. It is a, it is a very subjective sign, and some people can, you know, experience some amount of hyposthesia, even otherwise in patches, uh, even in psoriasis, for example, thick plaques, you may experience some hyposthesia. I wouldn't use it as a very hard sign, given the other options here, especially, okay? So next question, what is the diagnosis? you got three pictures, okay? So look at the low power. This is the low power image. See what the low power image is showing. Is there a particular pattern to it? Um, where is the infiltrate situated or is the infiltrate got a particular pattern to it? Please uh, note that. Higher power of the same section. Note the distribution of the infiltrate. Nature of the collagen maybe also. And this is a, another case. It's not the same case, but showing you a characteristic feature here. Um, this is not the same case, but I, I want you to get the diagnosis and this is showing the characteristic feature. So you've got one, low power, slightly higher power and different case showing a characteristic feature which is not seen in the uh, case that I've shown you earlier. Okay, so what is the diagnosis? You've got four options. I think we'll go to the Kahoot quiz where you can answer them in your own time. You've got, you'll have 20 seconds there anyway. So your options are Right. So I've got the the People, you know, 45, 47 people getting the right answer. The diagnosis is indeed necrobiasis lipoidica. This is an easy one, actually, because uh, I'll explain the answer in a second. But yeah, the leaderboard remains unchanged. Uh, why is this necrobiasis lipoidica? In necrobiasis lipoidica, you see this typical tiring of the infiltrate. You see this? You see the infiltrate in different tires. You see one layer here, one layer here. This is called a cake or sandwich pattern of infiltrate, okay? So this cannot get more typical than the sandwich pattern of infiltrate. It's called a cake or sandwich pattern. And then you go higher power, you're seeing necrobiosis. Uh, not so visible here. You see the collagen is degenerate in this particular picture. But this is typical necrobiosis. And that's why I showed you this picture. I showed you, I told you it's the same case. This is typical necrobiosis, okay? So the answer is necrobiosis lipoidica. So necrobiasis lipoidica has a sandwich or cake layering appearance, alternate layers of degenerate sclerotic collagen and layers containing granulomatous infiltrates. Okay, so this is another example of the same thing. So this brings us to the, the we basically discuss the two major subtypes of palisading granuloma. Palisading granuloma is a subtype of necrobiotic granuloma because palisading may also be seen in furrow body reactions. So you see epithelioid uh, histiocytes, which are palisaded and arranged roughly parallel to each other. Perpendicular to the, to the edge of a central area of altered necrobiotic collagen or elastic fibers. Okay, this is a case of granuloma annulare. So this again is a red granuloma, uh, sorry blue granuloma. Um, necrobiosis is a red granuloma. See here, this is a red granuloma. This is a blue granuloma, uh, granuloma annulare. This is, you see the palisade of histiocytes around the necrobiotic collagen. Okay, now so here we've discussed the four major patterns. We've described sarcoidal granuloma. Devoid of inflammatory cells other than epithelial histocytes, but you can have a sprinkling of lymphocytes here and there. Tuberculoid granuloma, suppurative granuloma, and palisaded granuloma, or necrobiotic granuloma. Okay. So these are the four types of granulomas. So in the evaluation of granulomas, the next feature that we that I usually use is the arrangement of granulomas. So how are the granulomas arranged? Now I discussed earlier uh, the leprosy pattern. The leprosy pattern basically granulomas arranged around the neurovascular bundles and the appendageal structures. You see here, these are called curvy, it's also called the curvy linear pattern, okay? You see here, this is an eccrine duct and you see the granuloma following that and there's a hair follicle around which is a granuloma. There's a pilar uh, muscle here, but in higher power, you can see the granuloma centered around the pilar muscle or around the follicular structures or the vascular bundles. 
So this is a typical leprosy pattern. You see here, the eritorous pylorum being destroyed by the granuloma, by the tubercular granuloma. You can see this is a tubercular granuloma. You see the histocytes with histophilic cytoplasm. Um, so here the eritorous pylorum muscle destroyed. This is a very important feature when you're looking at Hansen's. And also, these are eccrine coils in the deep dermis. And when you're seeing granulomas around the eccrine coils, this again is a clue to Hansen's. Um, in tuberculoid granuloma, time, but if you're differentiating, trying to differentiate between sarcoidosis, in sarcoidosis, the granulomas are much more confident. So, the entire thing is maybe destroyed, even the you may, you may not see the eritorous pylorum muscle. So, you don't see this particular pattern to it. It's much more confident in sarcoidal granuloma. But tuberculoid granuloma, there is some normal uh, skin in between, and you see this curvilinear pattern. Okay. If you have any doubts, uh, please do uh, put them in the chat box. We'll answer them at the end. So what is the pattern here? The pattern here, this is not a question, by the way. I am just I just put up the question mark there, but that's not a quiz question. So here, you're, what you're seeing is epidermal atrophy, and you're seeing a dense band-like lichenoid infiltrate. And again, this is granulomatous as well. So this is called the lichenoid and granulomatous pattern. Okay. So when talking about the arrangement of granulomas, lichenoid and granulomatous pattern is also a type of arrangement because you're seeing a lichenoid and a granulomatous pattern. Okay. It's arranged around the basement membrane and along the appendageal structures to some extent. Okay. So here's a question for you. What, which non-infective entity typically demonstrates a lichenoid and granulomatous pattern of infiltration, of inflammation, okay? So this is a fill in the blanks question. So please type your answer in small case. Make sure you don't have any spelling mistakes because there's only one correct answer and it's automated. So if you, even if you write uh, one alphabet wrong, you're going to get zero marks for it, okay? So which non-infective entity typically demonstrates a lichenoid and granulomatous pattern of inflammation and your time starts... Now, after a second, you have to type in your answer. answers but uh, yeah only three of you have got it right by the looks of it um so the answer is like in nitidus that's a typical example okay let's uh, shall we review the answers see uh, a lot of people have put in sle sle is not granulomatous it's lichenoid but not granulomatous lupus vulgaris yes but it's not the typical example uh, lichenoid granulomatous the typical non infective entity remember lupus vulgaris is the infective entity so it's the answer for infective entity, but not non-infective entity. And then you've got uh, sarcoidosis, which again is not the correct answer. So yeah, number of other answers which are not correct anyway. So let's uh, proceed. And let's see who's got the right answers. So Savega Gupta, well, interesting. So that the leaderboard remains unchanged. Savega so Gupta is uh, leading now because she's got nine correct answers in a row and there's a big margin for the others to catch up. So let's see, we've uh, still got a number of questions to go. This is only question number nine. We've got 10 more to go. So this is a typical example of lichenitis. Uh, and you see, I've discussed this in the lichenoid uh, talk as well. You see a typical lichenoid infiltrate and granulomatous inflammation as well. Okay, so you can see the granuloma here. Right, so the next question here. So, lichenoid and granulomatous pattern of inflammation is not usually seen in. Is not usually seen in. Okay, that's the question. It's not usually seen in. So, the, it may be seen in a number of other a number of conditions here, but the question is not usually seen in. And here's a question. Here are your options. <laughs> Any 
two of you have got it right. Um, in fact, TTBT Hansen's have put it specifically because you often see a lichenoid infiltrate. And uh, especially it's a vacular type. It's not typical lichenoid, but it's an interface dermatitis. And uh, yeah, you, you often see that in, in Hansen's, especially in the TTBT spectrum. You often see that. And that's, I think, responsible, I believe, is responsible for the hyperpigmentation that you see, which I think is post-inflammatory in case of uh, the, the tuberculoid uh, spectrum, actually. Tuberculosis varicose cutis, you usually see lichenoid granulomatis. That's a typical example, along with lupus vulgaris, okay? I only told you lupus vulgaris uh, is the typical example. So uh, you, sh you shouldn't answer that. Whoever's answered, three people have answered lupus vulgaris. So the answer is sarcoidosis. You don't see any infiltrate along the interface in sarcoidosis. Even by exclusion, your diagnosis should be sarcoidosis. Okay, so leaderboard remains unchanged, actually. So Sadeo Gupta is still leading. So Raghavind is catching up a little bit. Right, excellent. So we're, we're almost midway. Um, so lichenoid granulomatous pattern infective. See a number of entities here. As I told you, cutaneous TB, Hansen's, atypical mycobacteria, and deep mycosis. These are the typical examples. Um, Non-infective entities, like nidus, drug-induced hypersensitivity, CTCL, rheumatoid arthritis sometimes can cause uh, uh, skin uh, ashes with, produced with this pattern, which, which can produce this pattern along with drug eruptions. Lichenoid purpura and lichen striatus are rare examples. Okay, so distribution of arrangement granulomas, you've got the superficial distribution, lichen nidus, superficial deep, serpentine or curvilinear in Hansen's. Then we've got lichenoid and uh, granulomatous pattern we've already discussed. Deep granulomas, we've not discussed, deep GAN, rheumatoid nodule, interstitial granulomas, granuloma annulari, interstitial pattern and uh, palisade neutrophilic and granulomatous dermatitis, which also in overlaps with interstitial granulomatous dermatitis. Right, going on to the quiz. Question number 11. Presence of perifollicular granulomas excludes which of the following? Okay, let's go to Kahoot. Presence of perifollicular granulomas excludes which of the following? And your options are... <laughs> Majority of you, 30 of you have got it right. The answer is none of the above. Lichen striatus can have perifollicular granulomas, and that's one of the clues to the diagnosis. Also, periacrine granulomas may be seen, periacrine infiltrates may be seen rather. Lichen scrofosorum typically is perifollicular. I know that can't be the answer at all. Um, so it actually is the diagnosis to consider if you've got perifollicular granulomas. That's a typical histological feature. Herpes folliculitis can be granulomatous in some cases, and that's also, it does not exclude it. Uh, so none of the above is the correct answer. So let's see what the leaderboard is like. So Gitanjali has moved up, uh, Nivedita and Fatima, and uh, Deepali is the highest climber of 14 places. Sevega Gupta is still on top. Uh, others, you still have time to catch up. We've got, I think, eight more questions to go. So, um, yeah, this is an example of a perifollicular granuloma or folliculitis, where you can see this pattern. Okay. So perifollicular, you have non-separative and separative. Uh, these are your differentials. Peripylar granulomas, Hansen's, I've told you. Periacrine, Hansen's, and also lichen striatus. And then you have granulomas associated with paniculitis. And the examples are euthymia induratum, ENL, or necrobiasis, like poidica. You can see paniculitis as well, associated with a granulomatous infiltrate. Okay. So we've discussed type of granulomas, arrangement of granulomas, and then we come to presence of ancillary features. Now, it all sounds like a lot, but once you learn all this, everything automatically clicks in, actually, when you're actually evaluating a slide, uh, experienced pathologist. All this actually is automated into a system, and it comes to your mind. It's just repetition, repetition. As you keep seeing slides and learning and reading, everything just comes in. We don't actually think about all these features uh, every time you look at the slide. I mean, we do, but it's already stored in your memory, and it just comes in automatically. But it's just a question of learning repetitively, okay? Look at different cases, look at different slides, keep learning, keep reading, and that's how you learn it. So the first feature that I'm going to discuss is this particular feature, which is pseudoepithelium matters hyperplasia. I discussed this in lichen planus as well, and I told you that pseudoepithelium matters hyperplasia can be seen in granulomatous entities as well, okay? So this is an example of pseudoepithelium matters hyperplasia, and it can be seen 
a number of entities, including TB, cutaneous TB, lupus vulgaris, warty lupus, atypical mycobacteria, and deep mycosis. So if you're seeing pseudoepithelial mitosis hyperplasia, these are differentials. If you're seeing necrosis or ulceration, then you're thinking of a primary canker, scrofoderma, lupus vulgaris, papronecroid tuberculate, mycobacterium ulcerans, and even mycetoma sometimes. You though mycetoma, you can have both pseudoepithelial mitosis hyperplasia, and you can have necrosis or ulceration, you can have both. Follicular plugging, again, is a feature of post carlazer dermal leishmaniasis. So these are the epidermal changes we're looking for. Then comes the type of inflammatory cells. So we discussed giant cells, we discussed neutrophils. Eosinophils may be seen sometimes in parasitic infections, KBH, histosoma, they're not common. Dimorphic fungal infections can also present with eosinophils. So eosinophils are not a very hard flu, but they can sometimes be present. Plasma cells, we think of syphilis, especially, oops, sorry, um, uh, uh, sorry, just a second. I lost that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So syphilis uh, without with endothelial cells, uh, swelling, you're thinking about granulomatous so syphilis. Without vascular changes, you're looking at leishmanias or deep mycosis, you can have plasma cells. Plasma cells are non-specific, actually. I don't attach much importance to them. Uh, unless the clinical is favoring syphilis, I don't actually um, attach very much importance to plasma cells. So next comes to the types of giant cells. Um, as you probably already know from your basics, we've got three major types of giant cells. One is the foreign body giant cells where the, gyves, where the nuclei are irregularly distributed, lang hans giant cells where the nuclei are distributed in the periphery, and then the two-ton giant cells which look like a necklace in the middle of the cell. Okay, so this is a foreign body type giant cell, this is a lang hans giant cell, and this is the two-ton type of giant cell. Okay. So which is to tick all the correct options? Here you have to tick all the correct options. The first one is two-tone giant cells may be seen in dermatofibroma. Number two, two-tone giant cells are not seen in xanthalasma. Number three, foamy appearance of cytoplasm in these cells is due to lipid accumulation. Number four, foamy appearance of cytoplasm lepromatous leprosy is due to lipid, lipid accumulation. So I want you to tick all the correct options, okay? Which is true. I'll give you two seconds to think about this. There may be two, three, or even all the four options may be two. Let's go on to the quiz now. This is slightly tough. So multi-select, and also you have double points. Whoever gets the answer correct will get double points. This is the answer. This is your opportunity to catch up. The answer is, uh, the only false answer here is two-ton giant cells are not seen in xanthalasma, okay? The remaining all are correct um, because two-ton giant cells are basically, can be seen, are basically lipidized histiocytes, okay? Lipidized giant cells. So what is there between in, in two-ton giant cells is actually fat, it's lipid, and can be seen in lambdafibroma because in dermatofibroma, you see foamy histiocytes and sometimes you may also see two-ton giant cells, okay? So two-ton giant cells can be seen. That's one of the examples. Similarly, in uh, they're seen in xanthalasma as well because in xanthalasma, it's fat that's there. It's fat deposits, isn't it? Uh, cholesterol deposits, rather, uh, rather than fat. And then, yeah, the other two answers are correct. Whether it's uh, two-ton giant cells or whether it's foamy site, uh, periods of histiocytes and lepromatous leprosy, it's all lipid, okay? Anything that's foamy is usually lipid, whether it's a sebaceous hebocytes, whether it's, a, you know, foamy histiocytes, or whether it's a foamy appearance of cytoplasm and two-tone giant cells, it's all lipid. So let's see how the leaderboard is now. I think it's going to change significantly, yeah. So Veva Gupta is still on top, followed by Gitanjali, Fatima, Swati, and Niveta. Three in a row, Neha is back in the game. Well done. So yeah, this is an interesting quiz because you've got multiple correct options. Now here is which is false. I think there's only one false option here. So the options are foreign body giant cells can be seen in granulomatous rosacea. Langerhans giant cells are not seen in sarcoidosis. Zhang giant cells are caused by fusion of macrophages or none of the above, which is the false answer, okay? So let's go on to the quiz. This is 13 of 20, as uh, 30 of 19 rather actually. One is uh, done. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, so the correct answer is Zhang 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 says are caused by fusion of macrophages. Um, well, actually, mm, I think I framed the question wrong. Langerhans Zhang says not seen sarcoidosis is also the correct answer. Actually, I I should have said seen. Um, let me just think about it. I often get uh, myself confused with this false and true. Langerhans Zhang says not seen sarcoidosis is false. So this is also the correct answer. Okay, so the leaderboard may be changing slightly depending on. Uh, so let me. Um, so the leaderboard that we're going to show at the end may not be the correct leaderboard because the answer will change. Uh, in fact, there'll be two correct answers. So whoever has scored uh, Langerhans Jang says not seen sarcoidosis will also get the correct answer. So um, let's not go by the leaderboard that we're going to show now. I'm going to go through the answers later and uh, tell you who's the, who's the, uh, who's the uh, winner later on. So apologies for this, because this question is slightly mulled up. I've got myself muddled up trying to give you a difficult question. So foreign body giantesses can be seen in granulomatous rosacea. That is true, actually. It's not false. Um, Langerhans giantesses are seen in sarcoidosis. In fact, that's the only type of giantesses that are usually seen. Foreign body may be seen, but it's unusual. Langerhans giantesses are, are seen in sarcoidosis. Zhang giantesses are caused by fusion of epithelial cells. It's caused by fusion of the keratinocytes. It's not caused by fusion of macrophages. So that is definitely false. But even uh, Langerhans gels is not seen in sarcoidosis is also false, actually. Okay, so uh, apologies. I'll go through the uh, leaderboard uh, questions and uh, remark the answers because I can do that at the back end later. And I'll announce the results later on. Okay, so um, let's go on. So even if, you, uh, even if you've uh, not on the top, so don't worry. If you've answered this correct, you may still be uh, on the leaderboard. Oops, sorry. Um, right. Uh, I've now missed this. Skip this. I'll show you the question. So we're skipping one question. Don't worry. Um, so I'll just go to the quiz and I'll show you what I was going to show you. So this is the case of tubercular Hansen's. What is the arrow pointing at? I couldn't show you this question because of, I've already clicked on the uh, quiz. So apologies for that again. Uh, so what I was pointing at is actually a Langhans, a foreign body giant cell. And the reason I've tried to show you this is that foreign body giant cell is not specific to um, foreign body reactions. It can be seen also in tuberculoid Hansen's or even sarcoidosis. So this is actually a foreign body giant cell. Um, it's the case of tuberculoid Hansen's. You don't necessarily need to see Langhans giant cells only. You may see tubercloid, uh, sorry, foreign body giant cells, especially if there is um, follicular destruction where the, there is keratin in the dermis, and this keratin can elicit a foreign body reaction. Okay, so this question was put up to show you that, but um, unfortunately, I've already clicked on the question, so I'm not going to, um, yeah, I'm not going to uh, mark that. Nobody has answered it, so it's okay. So the leaderboard remains unchanged, uh, hopefully. Right. So let's go on to the next uh, slide. So Langhans giant cells, as I told you, can be seen in tubercular granular matter, leprosy, late cirrhosis, deep fungal sarcoidosis, leishmaniasis, and Crohn's. Crouton giant cells seen in any lesions with high lipid content, which includes fat necrosis, xanthoma, xanthalesma, xanthogranuloma, and dermatofibroma. I discussed vascular changes and endothelial swelling, vasculitis. Epidermal infarction and dermal hemorrhage can be seen and disseminate the aspergillus fusarium infection. And if there's massive epidermal, subepidermal, intradermal edema, then you're thinking about anthrax. So the other dermal changes that we may see, solar elastosis and acne GA, dermal fibrosis, if you're seeing that, then you're thinking about chronic infections, that which is basically uh, deep mycosis, mystoma, scrofoderma, gamata, Dermal coagulated necrosis, again, papillonecular tuberculid or mycobacterium ulcerans. Dermal edema may be seen in cryptococcus, particularly the mucinous type. And the last feature is basically identification of organism or specific cytopathic changes. So question number 15, clues to infective etiology include, tick all the relevant options here, okay? Clues to an infective etiology. Is it pseudoepithelium as epidermal hyperplasia? Fibrinoid necrosis is center of the granuloma, presence of neutrophils or Langerhans giant cells. Okay, so what is the clue to an infective etiology? Click, tick all that relevant. Now remember, uh, some of these features are present in even non-infective entities. So don't tick that just because you know you have discussed it. Just remember, 
I want you to pick up clues to infection. And that's what I want you to pick up. OK? So let's see if you can get this right. I've already discussed this. Question number 15. You have to tick all the relevant, all the correct options. Answers are pseudo epithelial hyperplasia and presence of yeast The number of you have ticked fibrinoid necrosis. Fibrinoid necrosis is not, uh, it can be seen in sarcoidosis. That's a typical example of fibrinoid necrosis. Okay. In infective granulomas, the necrosis is usually of a caseating type. Okay. So, though a lot of you have answered fibrinoid necrosis, that's not the correct answer, unfortunately. Langhans giant cells can be seen also non infective entity. So, the correct answer is pseudo epithelial epidermal hyperplasia and presence of neutrophils. So the leaderboard, uh, Swati is, is uh, come up and Fatima Nazir and Savira Gupta are on top. But remember, this may also change depending on how I remark the questions later on. Okay, so um, let's see uh, who's, uh, let's go to the next uh, slide. So histological features that should raise suspicion are pseudo epithelial epidermal hyperplasia, caseation, Suppuration and also presence of organisms, which I didn't put up. But yeah, this is an example of Majoshi's granuloma where you're seeing uh, fungal spores around the uh, hair follicle. So you're seeing the hair shaft and fungal spores around it. This is a Majoshi's granuloma. This is an example of CMV showing the typical eosinophilic inclusions within the cell. You see a very large cells here. So this is a CMV infected cell. The cells become megalo, which is big, and typical eosinophilic inclusions as well. This is an example of rhinosporidiosis, where you see an endospore filled, filled with sporangia. I'm not going to go into the all the infectious entities because that will become a different lecture altogether. So special stains can be done uh, in the evaluation of granulometer. You can do gene sustain for LD bodies, AFB stain for mycobacterium leprae, TB. Okay, and uh, but TB is very difficult actually on special stains usually. You don't find AFB unless uh, it's a canker or official TB um, where they may be present, um, but otherwise usually absent, actually. Remember, no cardia and actomyces, um, uh, no cardia stains weakly with AFB, can, so AFB can be used as a differential because actomycosis does not stain with AFB. And then you have mucinamine stain for cryptococcus, Fontana mycin can also be used, Alcian blue can also be used. Uh, gram stain for botry mycosis and actomycosis and PS or silver stains for fungi. There's a gram stain showing actomycosis. These are the actomyces, a gram stain highlighting them. Okay, so we'll come to the last three questions. Example of granulomatous diseases which also demonstrate vasculitis include. I've already shown you the slide briefly. Um, so here are your options. Uh, erythema nodosum leprosum, Lucius phenomenon. Miller TB or papillonecrotic tuberculosis. So you have you have to take all the correct answers and you'll get double points as well for this. So this is your chance to catch up. Example of granulomatous diseases that also demonstrate vasculitis. Take all the correct answers. <laughs> are correct. Uh, ENL, Lucio's phenomenon, Miller TB is a type of septic vasculitis. Papillonecrotic tuberculate, Lucio's and ENL, you see a leukocytoclastic vasculitis usually, okay? So all of them are actually the correct answers. Let's see how the leaderboard is. So Savera Gupta, Fatima Nazir, Gitanji, Swati, and now Shubhasri is now on the uh, top five as well. So uh, yeah, we've got about only around uh, 700 points between the first two. So let's see if uh, uh, Fatima Nazir can defeat Savera Gupta, who's who's actually uh, done very commendably. She's got the top marks and she's won 
uh, I think two of or three out of the previous five quizzes. Well done. So let's go to the next question. Yeah, next actually it's the algorithm. So my algorithm for stepwise evaluation of galnomas is looking at the epidermal changes, lichenoid or interface change, you go from top to bottom, looking at the features in the granuloma, type of granuloma, whether it's necrosis, caseation, et cetera, arrangement of granulomas, and looking at other inflammatory cells, then dermal changes, I've already discussed necrosis, edema, fibrosis, vascular changes, vasculopathy or vasculitis, and then presence of organisms. We often have to do serial sections to look at organisms. Uh, they may not be visible in the first section. Evaluate at least four sections at 40 power to uh, you know, look for organisms. So question number 17, this is a slightly difficult question, and this may filter out people uh, who are um, slightly weaker in dermatopathology, but don't worry, this is all a learning experience. It doesn't matter whether you win the quiz or not or how you're faring, as long as you remember and learn. So this uh, is a case, which systemic disease associated with this case? Uh, you've got the low power image, but the clue is really in the higher power image. Look at the type of cells here, um, particularly the type of giant cells that are being depicted. And the final clue is actually in here. Okay, if you know this, if you've seen this case in your textbooks or physically, you won't forget this. I don't even need to give you the history for this. Uh, so you, once you know the diagnosis, then your uh, associations come. So the, your answers, the options are diabetes, monoclonal gammopathy, lung cancer, or gout. Okay, and you get double points if you answer this. Let's see. Um, there's only one correct answer, by the way. Double points. Which systemic disease associated with this? I don't know if you've got it right. This is actually necrobiotic xanthogranuloma and associated with monoclonal gammopathy. Let's see what the leaderboard is like. So the top three haven't changed. Ayurvind and Kipa have come uh, further. Sadega Gupta, because she's answered this correct, has got double points. Well done. Um, so let's see um, Yeah, why I say so. So this here is showing a typical angulated hist uh, histocyte with uh, the nuclei arranged in an angulated manner, okay? This is supposed to be typical of um, necrobiotic xanthogranuloma. So you see here, this is a granulomatous infiltrate, superficial and deep, going into the fat as well. And typically what you're seeing here, what are called cholesterol clefts, okay? This is not gout. If you look at a picture of gout, you'll know why this is not gout. Gout doesn't have clear spaces like this, though you can have them in, uh, we don't have these sort of sharp needle-shaped edges, okay? So this is a typical example of cholesterol cleft associated with necrobiosis. You can see the necrosis of the collagen here, okay? And uh, foamy histiocytes, you can see the foamy histiocytes here. Can you make out the foamy histiocytes? So this is an example of necrobiotic xanthogranuloma. It's a xanthogranuloma because of the foamy histiocytes, okay? And you're seeing cholesterol clefts. So this answer is necrobiotic xanthogranuloma associated with monoclonal gammopathy, okay? So we've got two more last questions. Which of these four patterns excludes an infectious granuloma? We've already discussed the patterns. Which of these four patterns excludes an infectious granuloma? A, C, A and C, or none of the above? Okay. Here are uh, your options in Kahoot. the above actually because any of the granulomas can be present in infective entities okay so let's see what the leaderboard is like no change okay so Vega Gupta is still leading um, so let's see the last question coming up two of these four patterns are most suggestive of infection or infective origins okay two of these four patterns are most suggestive suggestive of infective origins so two of these four patterns 
If you've seen them, you should think of an infection. Though all of them can present in infective conditions, two are more suggestive, okay? So which are the two answers that I want? Let's go to the quiz. So you have multi-select, you have to select two options. Don't select three, only select two. is actually tuberculoid and suppurative. So these are two patterns that are suggestive of infection. Sarcoidal, not usually suggestive of infection, and necrobiotic as well, not usually suggestive of infection. So the two more commoner granulomas are the tuberculoid and the suppurative types. Okay. So answer is B and D, which most of you have got it right. So I think that's the end of the quiz. I don't think the leaderboard is going to change very much. So please rate the session on a scale of one to five and do give your feedback in the comment section in, in the Zoom app. <laughs>
pathologists in general are not trained in dermatopathology and are not trained in dermatology. So um, often they um, write correlate clinically. But how do you correlate clinically if you don't know your derm path? Okay. Uh, only someone who knows dermatopathology can correlate the histopathology with the clinical. So please uh, do read on the histopathology of every case that comes up, whether it's just a simple case of psoriasis, granuloma, annulari, et cetera. Lever's book is a good, uh, I don't have any problems with that. It's it's a very small book though. I mean, Lever's histopathology is, is good. It's not as extensive as Mickey and Whedon. This is what uh, Mickey and Whedon were what recommended by um, my uh, mentors when I was training the UK for the um, you know dermatopathology uh, diploma exam. Uh, this is what uh, most experts follow. Lever is a good book. I have no problems with that. Um, but this is what I followed. Um, I have not read Lever back to back, but I've read Whedon and Mecky back to back at least 10 times each. So yeah, it's just a question of reading and reading. Post-MD fellowship in Dermpath gives some guidance. Yeah, um, Dermpath fellowships, a number of fellowships available. If you go to the IADVL website, the, they do send... Um, emails from time to time. I recently evaluated, uh, or was asked to evaluate actually, uh, friends of us in the SIG Dermatopathology Group. We were asked to evaluate, um, you know, uh, candidates for a Dermpath Fellowship, which IADVL sponsors from time to time. The Dermatopathology Society of India website also has a list of fellowships that are available. Um, so yeah, please go to the link, go to the sites. And if you have any questions, you can always email um, the Dermatopathology Society, um, or uh, yeah, or you can email the IADVL Academy as well. They would be able to answer. Our IGD and PNGD, same NT. Whedon says they're synonyms. Lever differs. Uh, yes, they are the same NT as far as I'm concerned. They have this bigger overlap. In fact, there's a number of overlap between um, a number of uh, histopathological NTs, in fact, and IGD and PNGD come into the same uh, category. That's one of the questions somebody's posing, Chakri. So yeah. Uh, the next session, we've got sessions uh, um, scheduled every two months. So the next session will be the end of February. Uh, if it clashes with the Dermacon, I haven't checked the dates yet. I will uh, change the date and the date will always be announced one or two days before the session. So please check your emails and your WhatsApps. Uh, there's an email uh, going on from uh, the IADVL Academy as well as from the Dermatopathology Society of India. I think the next session topic is vasculitis. I've got to uh, check uh, my schedule. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I think it is vasculitis or paniculitis, one of the two. Uh, what about vasculitis and, um, you know, palisading neutrophilic and granulomatous dermatitis? Somebody asked. Vasculitis can be present. Uh, it's not um, It's not a differentiating feature. Now, remember, palisading neutrophilic and granulomatous dermatitis associated with drugs and systemic conditions and vasculitis can be present. Interstitial granulomatous dermatitis is just a variant of it. Um, it's in the name for it. Often neutrophils can be seen even in this entity. Um, I wouldn't, uh, you know, let us discuss that in the vasculitis session. All right, I'll make I'll make it a point that um, we'll discuss both the entities together: interstitial granulomatous dermatitis and uh, uh, PNGD in the vasculitis session. I'll uh, I'll show you a slide there and we'll discuss that. Okay, so thank you all. Um, uh, I had answered SIG down to pathology and that PNGD was given the wrong answer and the answer was IGD. Somebody has posted them. I don't remember that. Um, yeah, I'll have to check. I I don't remember that. Sorry. Oh, SIG down to pathology. Uh, was that something I posted? I'm not aware of that. But vasculitis, I wouldn't use that to differentiate between the two. And in fact, I consider them as synonyms. So I don't think I've posted that question. It must be somebody else. Uh, who has posed a question about vasculitis present in PNGD and IGD or, or differentiating between them. So, um, yeah, let's let's discuss this again in the vasculitis session. Thank you very much and uh, look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much. Um, is there anything that uh, people from uh, Glodama want to say before we end the session? I don't know if uh, Dr. Lalit Gupta or Dr. Rashmi are there from the academy. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, sir. Uh, Rohit from Glodama. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thanks a lot. And uh, sorry for the technical error. Uh, this will not happen in next lecture. So thanks a lot. Thank All you, right. participant. Yeah.
Thank you, thank you. Thanks a lot.